Rachel Bussell. I'm calling in for the show. Rachel, you saved my life tonight. <laughs> everything, okay. everything is like um, going haywire. It's amazing. But... That's usually my life. <laughs> well, here's the interesting thing. We're, tape, we're on tape. We're going to tape. Okay. We're not on live, okay? Okay. And I'm holding in my hand, obsessed. Oh. Erotic romance for women. I know that over the years, romance novels are huge. Huge. When did the romance novels start getting a little bit more risque? I feel like that's happened in the last five years. Um, because I used to read them as a teenager, so say 20 years ago, and I didn't really realize how explicit, and not just explicit they were, but how you know out there, like there's threesomes, there's kink, and I think, um, you know, as long as the context is a relationship and a happy ending, within that, right now, you can get away with all kinds of things. And I think that's a really interesting dynamic, because no, I don't think you can say romance is just this and erotica is just this. I think there's a lot of blending of the two. Well, in real life, for sure. Uh, but uh, mainstream media, be it television, movies, uh, books, for some reason they don't want to push the envelope, and I don't know why. Um, sometimes they push it too much. Did you see that Ashton Kutcher movie, the recent one with Natalie Portman? The, um, okay, I'm 57. The language in it was way beyond the scope of my liking. And I'm no prude. But I just but felt using that kind of language throughout a movie, it really hurt the movie. Was it just the language or was it the, um, you know, plot? Like, did you feel like it went, they were going too fast? Because I saw the other movie, the one, um, there was another movie about the same topic. The change-up, oh, right, right, no, it wasn't the change-up, I understand what you're saying, the right. The one with, um, oh, I know they had stunt doubles, I just saw it, but anyway, it was the other one, one of them was called Friends with Benefits, which might be the one, I, I saw Friends with Benefits. Friends with Benefits, right, which was what this movie was, but it wasn't titled that. Right, um, I mean, I think it's interesting, because I do think some of it is generational, I think, um, you know, younger people, especially early 20s, late teens, I think there's a lower threshold for language and also for, I think there's, there's more openness, which is good in some ways, but I also think there are ways where things get rushed now that, that I, I don't think it's necessarily all good, but I do think that more information being out there is good. And we will get to your book, but I think this is a nice setup for our interview because, um, I just think that the, um, the Kutcher and Portman movie, and Jason Bateman and uh, Ryan Reynolds were recently in The Change Up. Same thing. I think it's um, as obnoxious for me as gratuitous violence. A little, bit, a little bit of balance makes for a... Because both movies actually had merit. And I thought that the use of the F word so much throughout the movie, really... What are they going to do for broadcast television? Was it used in casual conversation? It was just in the in the Ashton Kutcher movie. It was like every. It was just really foul language. The script was I'm just. I'm not against it per se, but I do think there's a diminishing law of returns where if you keep using those words, I mean, if you don't save them for when they have the right impact, and I think the same goes for writing. You know, um, then then they become sort of cliched and not really having the impact that they could. Now, when we get to these romance novels, as um, I don't read uh, romance novels, but I do read other books, of course. But as I see them in the stores, and I buy them for my godmother, so I send her cases of them, right? Yeah. I notice that the models are very uh, in very provocative positions, and their shirts are usually off. And the women usually see these bare-chested men. And isn't Fabio someone that kind of came out of that whole book thing? See, I know that. I hope there's more, I hope there's more variety. Um, I mean, I think there's some people who like, who like that in the sense that it's familiar. You know, they know what they're picking up when they pick up a certain kind of romance. And I actually read a lot of historical romances, and those are interesting because 
it's very different from what you would read in a modern one because in a lot of those, the women don't really know what sex is. You know, and it's, it's often they're either virgins or they're almost virgins, and the man might have more experience and he kind of shows her the ropes. And in a way, that's exciting, too, because it's about the context. You know, it's a different time when women didn't have as much freedom. You know, this is talking like the 1700s, 1800s. Which brings me to Obsessed. Now, my point was that the romance novels, I thought that the covers were pushing that envelope, but maybe not delivering inside, having not read them. That was my, um, the inference I got. You have a, a woman... I think they do. I mean, to a to degree. Like, I've read my fair share of romances, and I think, I think they do have good sex scenes, but they're told in a different way than, say, erotica, which is a lot of what I edit. And then, for me, Obsessed kind of merge those two so it's erotic and there are dirty words and it is sexy but it also has that romantic love angle so it's not just two strangers meeting hooking up and leaving it's it's couples kind of working things out via sexuality and via adventure and sometimes exes are coming back together um and, and i think it's it's interesting for me because it's a little bit different than what I normally do, which is more, the focus is less on the couple and more on the sex. And now, this is the opposite. You have the story, I Want to Hold Your Hand. It must be interesting being the writer and being the one putting the compilation together. It is. I, I you know, not everyone does that, but I like to do it partly because it's a challenge for me to, you know, how am I going to approach the topic in a way that has, that isn't repeating what everyone else has done. And it, this one was especially a challenge because that's not my usual style. I would say my usual style is a little grittier maybe, but, but it was really fun to think about something that I do think a lot of people care about, you know, what happens in a long-term relationship when one person changes. And in this case, in my story, it's about the man losing a lot of weight and becoming sexually desirable to other women and the woman being kind of jealous about that and uncomfortable. But that could apply to any major change that a couple makes over the long term. And I think that's something we don't always see a lot of. And something I would like to see more of is older people, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s. I feel like, and I do this too, a lot of the stories I see are about people in their 20s and 30s. And I think there's older people who do want to read erotica. I would imagine. And what's interesting to me is, as a child, I wrote, I read science fiction compilations. Um, so they'd be amazing stories, you know, the, the pulps. And then they would be collected in a, um, in a book, much like this, and you'd get your science fiction. Uh, I, w I never would have thought, if not getting your book, that erotica would have all these short little stories. all com So you don't have to read it from cover to cover. You can go and jump right in and grab a story. I think it's great because I think a lot of people, that is what they want to read. And they're really, in, in the erotica world, there's, there's a lot of anthologies. I would say probably more than there are novels. And I think it means also that you're getting variety. So whether it's erotic romance like this or whether I've done books about, say, spanking or whatever it is, you know, you're going to get different takes on the topic so that people can see, well, it's not all one thing. It's different things, and it's just because you might be interested in that doesn't mean you're interested in every aspect of it. And I, and I know that a lot of couples either read them together, or someone might read a story and say, oh, what do you, you, know, what do you think of this? And, and it can be a safe way to bring up a topic that you're interested in without, you know, without necessarily putting pressure on the person in the moment, you know, without putting them on the spot. You can kind of say, I like this story, what did you think? And then, you know, based on what they say, you can kind of gauge what they might, you know, what they might be open to in terms of starting a conversation. Now, um, you've edited over 30 erotica books. I wonder if a science fiction editor gets numb from all the different sci-fi. What's it like um, going through other authors' ideas of sex? I think, to me, that's what keeps it really interesting. If I had written hundreds and hundreds of stories. I mean, I've written a lot, but if I had to write 20 stories every time for the book, I, I don't think I'd be able to do that because I, I think it's just, you know, my imagination. I mean, I have a good imagination, but 
it's still never going to come up with all the ways other people approach a topic. And I think that's wonderful. You know, I've had stories about chemistry, like a science lab, and I would never write that because I almost failed chemistry, <laughs> you know. So, so it's fascinating to me, like, what people bring to their stories and the different styles and history, and sometimes people will include things about art or pop culture, and, and it'll be something that I'll research, and I'm like, that's super interesting, like, that's a real artist, and they just, you know, work that into their fiction story, and I, I, to me, it's, it's also a way to be social, even though I'm working on it by myself, but I'm meeting all these people from around the world via their stories, and that's fun for me. Uh, is it obligatory to have eight pages for a uh, erotica book? Uh, uh, an erotica story? Do they have to be really? Uh, um, yeah, you know, some are longer, some are shorter. Uh, I did a book this spring called "Gotta Have It," where all the stories were only twelve hundred words or less. So that's only five pages, and the idea there was that you could read it in a few minutes, and you know, it's like a quickie. You just read it and move on to the next one. Some people like longer stories. Um, you know, I probably, for me personally, like 10, 12 pages is is good for me because I feel like I would rather have someone get to the end and want to read more than be bored by reading and reading and reading. So I feel like if someone says, oh, I wish it were longer, that's, that's a compliment in its way. No, I don't want to come off as stuffy because I go to science fiction conventions, even though I've kind of departed from the science fiction world. I still go back to what I did when I was a teenager, you know, and the, the conventions are fun. Are there erotica conventions? Funny you should ask, because I just got back from what I believe is the first erotic writing conference in Las Vegas last weekend. And it was mostly geared towards writers, so I don't know if these conventions that you're talking about are more like Comic-Con, where there's also fans. So this was mostly aimed at people who want to write or who are writers and want to learn more. But I think if they do another one, definitely there could be a, a community of people who, who aren't necessarily writers but, you know, just are interested in reading. Um, I mean, sometimes it can be kind of awkward because if someone says, I really liked your story, I, you know, masturbated to it. I mean, I don't always know what to say because that is a compliment, but then, you know, I don't necessarily want to know that. So, you don't want to know it, but it is like a high compliment. But it is a compliment, and sometimes people will say, oh, I remember that story you wrote. Like, I wrote one about dishwashing, because I kind of find washing dishes sexy. Not all the time, but in certain circumstances. Like, if someone's made me dinner, and then I wash those dishes, I think it's very personal and sensual. And I wrote about that, and a lot of people remember that one because it was so unusual. I will and go I, home and kiss my plates tonight. And people do remember <laughs> the ones that speak to them in some way, whether because it taps into a fetish they have or whether because it's something they wouldn't want to do in their real life, but the story, the writing, pulled them in. And that, that I find fascinating. Like with that chemistry story, I'm not into chemistry. I don't, I'm not in, in, into it, you know, sexually or not sexually, but that story, which is by this woman, Velvet Moore, was, was so fascinating because you just got into the character. And to me, that's one of the really big um, bonuses of erotica, that you can learn about yourself and what what interests you. It doesn't always mean that you want to do it in real life. I feel like that's something that people worry about. Like, if I get turned on by this bondage story, does that mean that I have to do it or that I should be doing it? And for some people it might, but it doesn't necessarily mean that. It could just mean you really like the story. And, you know, isn't it sometimes better to live vicariously through a book so you don't have to uh, indulge in something you might not want to? Yeah, and, and I mean, definitely I think there are times when, when you try to act out the fantasy, it goes awry because, of course, it's sometimes going to be better in your head than it is in real life. And sometimes you have to, you know, try things out to find that out. But I think just the idea that fantasy has value as fantasy is something that erotica can you know, help people to understand and to, to, to just learn about wh what what people are thinking. Uh, to me, I'm, I feel like I'm a voyeur both, you know, in person and through reading. So I just love seeing those diverse things that people come up with. 
Now the convention, this was the first one in LA, Las Vegas. There must be some conventions for, or was this the first for erotica? For just erotica, I believe so. I mean, there's been things about erotica at, at other kinds of conferences, but this was just about, you know, erotica. And it was, it was very interesting because people who, some people write more in the kind of science fiction fantasy realm, and some people write more realistic things. I was on a panel about using your personal sex life as fodder for your stories, and it was very interesting because everyone on the panel had in some way used something that happened to them in fiction. Um, you know, um, HBO everyone. has, what, real sex, and I think it is so poorly done. And um, okay. I just feel that it's like... Um, Sensationalistic? Reality TV and and it just doesn't have the charm for me that a good solid movie does. And I don't care if it's erotica or science fiction or just a good story about human existence. I just, uh, like Taxi Cab Confessions, I can't watch that. <laughs> you know, your book has more substance. Your book is, uh, uh, you know, fun. You can jump into it. You can jump out of it. But I feel that like some of those shows fall flat. Because it feels contrived? Yes, and I know that... Um, Taxi Cab Confessions, I know a musician who, uh, you know, told me basically the director called them up and they are contrived. There's a little spontaneity and at least the fantasy, you can be spontaneous in a book and, write, and a writer can be spontaneous. I think an actor, it takes a real talent to do that. I guess, yeah, I mean, I don't watch a ton of reality TV, but I feel like if I do, I kind of suspend disbelief because otherwise... I wouldn't enjoy it, you know, so I feel like if, if, if you can't suspend a little bit of the disbelief, which I, I don't think there's necessarily a right way or wrong way, you know, but I feel like, like, I feel like the people who say, oh, reality TV, it's not all real, well, I, I don't necessarily think they're trying to say it's all real, I, I mean, uh, some people might think it is, I don't know. Now, uh, Rachel, do you go out and go to the bookstores and do signings? bars or events, not ah. so much at bookstores. A lot of bookstores are not that into erotica. I think, you know, I, I know I've been told I have a lot more sales online than in bookstores, which seems odd to me because I think people would be. I mean, I know there are people who are interested in erotica, but most bookstores, big or small, don't really have a section for that. Some do, but... Back in my 20s, when I was in a rock band, um, my guitarist and I went to New York because we had business meetings. And we went, I took him to the business meetings with me, and he said, hey, let's go. It was his birthday. It was October. And we went out. He goes, let's go to a live sex show. And I'd never been to one in my life. Fascinating thing was that I didn't find it erotic at all. What it was was uh, a, a man and a woman on stage performing, and the audience was just John Q. Public, and people were just applauding after the sex act. And it was very much, much like watching a movie. It wasn't interactive at all. It was like a voyeur. It was like being a voyeur. I think that's interesting because I think some people like that aspect of it, that it's, that it's public and then you know, there's a lot of people watching. Um, I don't know. I've never been to something like that. I've been to a strip club, but... Um, well, strip clubs a whole other thing, but this fascinated me because there were people, executives, they were like married couples or people who looked like married couples and, you know, people with briefcases, and they were just sitting there watching this and applauding very politely like it was, it might as well have been Shakespeare. <laughs> and I'm like, we were blown away because we had no idea what to expect and we just walked out of there stunned. And it I was... Don't know what I, would, I don't know what I would do in that environment because I think I would also be watching the other people because I'm always... Like, I always people watch because I think people are fascinating. Now, there's a good storyline for you. Go to a sex show and find out that it's not sexy at all, and so you have to go and concoct a better fantasy than what was there on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> it was such always a... Always <laughs> wanting to know, like, what do the people like in real life, and what, what are they, you know, what, what do they like? And what do they like about it? Um, yeah, I mean, I was on the show in Toronto, Naked News, um, where they conduct news broadcast naked not not the guest or the, i think it's optional but literally i was sitting on a couch and the woman interviewing me took 
off her clothes, sat down, and started talking to me. And, you know, we just had a conversation about writing and stuff. And after a while, I got used to it. But it was so fascinating to me that they do this real work. I mean, they, they cover events and stuff, but nude, you know. And I was just fascinated by that. Well, that makes me uncomfortable because I like my clothing. And if other people want to be nude, that's fine with me. But um, I personally don't want to be. Yeah, no, it's definitely, I don't think a lot of people can handle that. And and it was kind of weird to be being interviewed by someone. But, um, but it was also really interesting to me. Sure. I mean, you've got 30 yeah. books. And it's like, and here you are, the book almost coming to life interviewing you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you ever come to the Boston area, we have a studio here. And, you know, these are more fun, of course, on screen. Um, and, and we keep our clothes on here. Which is well, no, I, um, I, I, I'm in New York, so it's not too far. I did a reading once in Brookline. Um, oh, I'd love to come back to Brooklyn. The Booksmith. Um, actually, it was a Good Vibration, but I, I know Booksmith. I like them. Oh, Good Vibration is right near there, I think. Yeah. So, well, we'll, I'm f we'll let you know. Uh, Rachel, I'm fascinated. You're a blogger, and your website is? RachelKramerBustle.com. R-A-C-H-E-L. K R A M E R B U S S E L dot com. New York based author, editor, and blogger. Um, oh, there's so much more I want to talk to you about, but we don't have a, a lot of time right now. Um, I will say this is off the topic of sex, but at my, at my other PG life, I have a blog about cupcakes. And people always say, oh, what does that mean? Is that like sexy cupcakes? I'm like, no, just cupcakes. Cup, it's called Cupcakes Take the Cake. And literally, you know, we review cupcakes and write about them. and we're planning a cruise to Bermuda next year, a cupcake cruise. So that's kind of my other life. <laughs> well, cupcakes are sexy. So what's that? Cupcakes? Cupcakestakethecake.blogspot.com. Cupcakestakethecake.blogspot.com. Wow, we'll have to check that out. Rachel, thank you so much for your time. You're always invited back on Visual Radio. Thank you. And uh, maybe I know you have another book coming out. Maybe in December or uh, November or December we can talk again about your new book. Boston, I will definitely let you know. Very good. Thanks. Thank, thanks so much for your time. Have a good night. You too. Thanks.